Hey everyone, welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy. And I'm Monica. And we are excited to be here today because we have an episode in which we're responding to someone who reached out to us on Facebook, and I'm so excited that we got reached out to. I know, right? It's I like love engagement. We're not just doing this like into the into the ether out there. It's that's like people right. are actually responding. That's so. right, right. So we had Bernard from the UK, and he reached out and said, you know, how can we be better at dissuading fraud in blockchain and innovation? And I thought, you know what, that's a really interesting topic. And, you know, we hear about Bitcoin scams and, you know, token scams and a lot of these things going on, but I think I've heard that before. Right. I've heard it in all over the place, That's, of course. Yeah. So, so, you know, Monica, we were talking before about it and, you know, there is an interesting place in which there is, yes, fraud happening. It happens at every every technology that I've ever been involved in for the last 25 years, like every time there's a new technology, there's fraud and scams that go on because a lot of people don't understand the technology. They don't vet them properly. They don't ask the right questions. That's true. I mean, not just from an investor standpoint, but you know, when you think about it, it's a lot easier to tell a lie um, to a couple of people in a room where they don't have a lot of opportunity to cross-reference. You know, you were talking about the uh, Theranos, not just you know, fraud, but the conspiracy behind all that fraud of so many people, her family even, that were involved in, in really just lying to investors and painting a totally false picture. Right. And, so and and for those of you who don't... Inspiring. For those of you who don't know, I just want to like back up. So the inventor, um, it's Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, just came out on HBO, and it's the Elizabeth Holmes story about how Theranos came about and and how it, it dissolved into going from nine hundred million dollars in investment and being worth almost ten billion dollars in valuation to being like. Uh, well, they're still in court, right? <laughs> so right, they're right, still, yeah, still in court. It could be negative value, right? It could be right. they owe money, right? And so, um, you know, so how does something like that happen? And I watched that last night, actually, ironically, after thinking about that, that we were going to talk about this today. And it really showed you that it, is, it has nothing to do with blockchain specifically or with Bitcoin or, with, you know, cryptocurrency. Or with health general. tech or it's with like, yeah, specific it's, anything. It's, it's really just like if people are going to lie, they're going to lie. But it also is a lot easier to either lie in a group of people that will agree with you yes. or lie alone where there's not a lot of other social proof. And so there might be something there in terms of, it's not a blockchain thing, but it's a social proof thing. You know, I mean, it's, it'd be harder to... Um, tweet a lie where lots and lots of people can be like, the sky is an orange. That's crazy. You know, but you could maybe convince a three-year-old who doesn't, hasn't been outside in a long time that the sky, that's actually called orange and you could, it could work. Right. So depending on the audience and depending on the isolation, I think you can get away with fraud much more easily than in a really social environment where everything is, you know, people are always watching and counter, you know, either agreeing in a very blockchain way or not agreeing and disagreeing and saying that's, that's false. So I think right. that there's an opportunity for social proof to win out, but that's just, it's a social conversation. It's not even a blockchain conversation. Right that's now, right. technology blockchain happens to mimic social proof in a technological way, but not the other way around, right? So it's not like blockchain is going to solve fraud. It's more like blockchain is finally looking at a way that, and, and is finally constructing technology that, that imitates what we've already figured out socially to do, which is see if we all agree with it or not. Right. And you know, this is a, this is a thing. I don't know that blockchain is a solution for any of those things in particular. There are solutions for problems within that structure. Like, you know, when you have rampant distrust going on or something like that, so you can have a more transparent view of those things, or you can have an opportunity to have checks and balances and, and a and mutual agreement across the block. So, you know, you look at that and, and I think that that's really interesting, but I do think what we've created in this, um, I'm going to call this in these disruptive technology environments over time and part of a Silicon Valley problem actually because that's where it starts out is that we like this is the hot new thing and we and that mutual agreement so I think you know like Theranos that that the people who were invested in that they were like how could Henry Kissinger be wrong like right. it's like you know how could these big players General Mattis how could he be wrong right so they right. start thinking there's something here because of the social proof of who was in it and yet no one asked the questions and so that's where we have to also be careful in blockchain is like, who are we involving? Is it diverse enough? And that's the conversation that I started having. And the answer that I gave Bernard initially was that 
you know, the reality is, is that I believe that a, a technology can be more sound. A company can be more sound when you're actually pushing back on them and asking those questions from diverse perspectives. So had someone been in the med tech industry started asking more questions, had that not been gated off and blocked off so strongly, then this would have come to light way sooner. Before the hundred, the nine hundred million dollar valuation, maybe so. Right, yeah. exactly. Or the but, investment level. Sorry. But if you look at it, everyone who was involved is there's there's a couple of things that I see is that they could stand to lose the money. Like they didn't. It wasn't. A, they wanted to be the early entrant, but they could stand that's to true. lose the money. Right. Well, like, that's. I mean, but that's like investment one hundred and one. Right. There's all right. kinds of deals that only people that can stand to lose the money are allowed to be a part of right now, thanks to the SEC. But you right. know, there's. This seems like such a social issue, really. Like, I just happen to, I mean, I tell this to people too. Like, I have a couple of billionaire friends. Odd, totally odd, being that I am not a billionaire. But I, and I good, also, have a good that you surround yourself with them, right? Well, I don't. It's just that I happen to know them occasionally. I run across them, I'm like, oh, and we actually have legitimate, like, deep friendships, right? So this isn't just like, oh, I, I'm really good at keeping a good Rolodex. I actually literally look out and try to get friends that are not like me. I have friends that are super crazy libertarians. I have friends that are, I mean, so just so far off the political spectrum and directions that I do not care to venture myself. But I am so curious. I'm like, what's it like over there? You know, like, you believe all kinds of crazy stuff, you know? And I mean, like I have cousins that really love their guns and, you know, on their birthday, they want to show the latest gun they bought. And I'm just like, you are that neighbor. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know what? but that but diversity just, is important. That diversity. It's what like, I think it bolsters, it makes my life more enriching. First of all, I just like it because I can ask people that I know won't agree with me. that are going to tell me such a different thing. And whether it's not just for a company or for an investment, it's like in my life, I want the chance to see and reflect on reality from multiple vantage points. And I only know what it's like to be me. I don't know what it's like to be them until I ask them and until I let them talk to me and, and ask me questions and, and challenge me or just, just give me like new info and new insights that I wouldn't have come up with. So I like the idea of not being the authority of my reality, but just the curious onlooker along with other people who I intentionally choose to be very different from me and give me their feedback too. Yeah. You know, and, and it, because I've worked so long in innovation, right? And just in general, like I think about the innovation process is so foreign to many, many people that they don't actually, they expect that this stuff can just be done, right? It's I was like, right. oh, the, the technology is fully formed, like it can be done. But there is a lot of invention along the way that has to come and has to happen. And uh, not recognizing that or not having a, a cognizance of that as you enter into evaluating and betting an investment or whether or not you want to start a company and be involved in that is short-sighted it to begin with. So I oh, think yeah. that that's where you really, where like, Elizabeth Holmes made a huge mistake in that she kept pushing back and saying, if I believe this can happen, the team will just make it happen. Well, that is not actually how Steve Jobs did it. Like right, that is right. not actually how Edison did it. He, you know, practically beat his employees to, to you know, work, hours and hours and hours so that they, you know, they had no light. They had to invent the light bulb. Like that, right. you know, really how it came about is that he just was a slave driver about it and didn't give up. Yes, but they were working at it at the core technology level and he was still listening to the people who knew what they were talking about. Right, right. And she wasn't. She had no one involved in the process who knew what they were talking about and who really could. And and anyone who did, she just discounted them for being contrary. And Again, so that's I, the thing. Like if you are looking to be the authority, you're probably looking to go down as wrong in history all by yourself then and bring whoever's with you down with you because you know we are it's just becoming more and more apparent whether it's evidenced in our in the way that we're technologically innovating or if it's evidenced in how we are communicating we are stronger in groups and we are stronger in social in social interaction i mean when you think about it what gives a, a, a youtube video you know, any value anymore. It's if everybody watches it. It's if everyone engages it. And that means they have to either agree with it or disagree with it, but they won't have to want to consume it. The power is in all of us engaging, not in someone saying, I know best or I have the right. best. That's why I'm not a huge fan of liking. Like I just think <laughs> liking is not, is not the point, right? <laughs> 
if you don't comment, which is why I so appreciate the engagement we've received here, is like, if you don't comment, then we're not having that conversation around whether or not this is valid and interesting. And, you know, I think that it brings up a a point that I am always questioning every time I go and I write about a lot of startups. So every time I write about them, I know there's a risk that like five months later, they could be gone. Right. Right. No, but that's innovation. Right. That's not even a risk. That's just a reality. And it's a reality. Yeah. There are lots of flashes in the pan, aren't there? You know? Yeah. Well, and all, all I can do is write a decent story about or, or, you know, ask good questions here about it and try to probe that. But that's why we have a disclaimer at the front of our podcast, right? right? We're not here giving advice or endorsing any of these companies because we're not, we don't have time to vet them for you. Yeah. Like, Right. And that's just, I'm not in the vetting process for people. (laughs) Right. It's not our day job. It's not what we are. And, you know, I really felt for the Wall Street Journal and the, and the guy who wrote the cover story on Fortune on Elizabeth Holmes, because, you know, it, it was like, they felt duped in that process too, because they tried really hard to vet it and get it, but they never could never get the answers they were seeking and they were on deadline and they're their editor said, publish, you know, and yep. that's how it comes about. And we're the same way here. We, we just, we, we got to publish, right? We got to send you out some episodes and bring you some interesting things to, to consider and think about. Luckily we're scratching the surface. That's all our job is. Our job isn't deep journalism, isn't investigative in any way, shape or form, right? But, but it is always a risk that when we are presenting something or thinking about it. So I try to ask those questions and I try to think about it as like, did they really answer that? Like one of the right. ones that's been, you know, going around in my mind is a lot of these cryptocurrencies, a lot of the apps that I've looked at, um, you know, even Nasco and some of the other companies. I mean, they are, they are not actually achieving everything that they claim they can do. Right. No. And we try to point that out. But are we really pointing out and diving deep into how they might not ex- succeed? I don't think we have the necessarily the bandwidth to do that. And well, that's the other thing is that, you know, a critical eye can somehow sometimes need a, a lot more investigative background than a cheerleading eye. And we kind of, yes. we look at things that we think are exciting and we champion them. And sometimes you're wrong, but you know, it, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is an exciting area. Let's look at this and look at that and look at that. And then, yeah, some of those stars go out, you know, but some of them live on. And I think right. that's fine. To right. be the critical voice is a very different, you know, it's a, it's a very different animal. From, coming from the art world, you know, I remember just looking at what art critics would say and thinking, why don't you just go read the telephone book and find meaning there? I mean, it was just <laughs> ridiculous when you, when you have people that are like, I'm outside of what you're doing, but I'm here to criticize it. It's just like, give me a break. If you like it, talk about it. If you don't, leave it to people to just like mull it over and not like it together. But you don't have to bring always a critical eye to everything. I think that people and work uh, can just, the proof can be in the pudding. Right. And I, and I do think that there is, if you do have a viewpoint that is critical, that is because of experience, that you do yeah. have an well, opportunity that to do sure. that, right? You do have an opportunity to, to do that. And that's really where whenever I try to look at some of the things that we're working on, I look at them and say, okay, are they, are they poised to build a good, stable company? Are they getting some market proof underneath it? Because when I see market proof, there's a, something to base some decisions on because yeah. I'm obviously not looking at their financial statements, right? You know, I mean, exactly. that's what, you know, there was a lot of criticism over Theranos because they never, none of the investors ever reviewed audited financial statements. After Which that just, much in, engage, I mean, you get that much investment. Oh my God. And these are oh the investors who should know better, right? These are you investors would think. who should know better, right? But well, they- okay, so you said it's a Silicon Valley thing. It starts there because they all know each other. And I think we can blame it on Silicon Valley because that happens to be like the behemoth of the problem. But really, this problem is just, again, people it's not, it's groups, it's group dynamics. It's people not going, hey, who's the dissenting voice? Let's value that. Not, yes. the, not always the criticism, but just like who, who has, a new, has a new question? Who came from a different country? Who's got a different experience? Who you know, is the minority in the room that might have a really interesting, diverse? It's like biodiversity. We only have one kind of broccoli that we buy in the store anymore. There used to be 30 kinds of broccoli that you, were available in North America and Amer- like in, in Europe. There right. no longer is. So there's a problem here, whether it's in our, cult, in our culture or in our permaculture, it's, it, there's a problem that we're like becoming more and more and more homogenous. And in so doing, we're going to, I mean, what happens when, you're, when um, your genetics become homogenous? You end up you know, becoming hemophiliacs like the, the Spanish aristocracy <laughs> back in the day. Right. You don't want to do that, you know? So I think that there's, 
there's a, a lot to be said for diversity in general. And in all ways, when you think, what's the person that I would rather not listen to right now? Maybe you should stop and listen to them just if nothing else, out of curiosity, somebody might have at some point before they put nine hundred million dollars into a company said, "Can we see your P and L?" Exactly. What? And so, and so, yeah, and you know, it, it, it is just one of those things where I look at that and I think, "Well, that would—that's not how I operate, right?" Like so, and that's good that I don't operate that way. And you know, and maybe you shouldn't have either. But you know, right? it's. it's um, I look at that as there is very, very big risk in a startup right. at all stages. Yes. And so when you're seeding something, you should be investing because you it's okay to lose the money because it's going right. to happen, right? And, and But going into at that- At some point, you know, you're, you're going to lose nine out of 10, so- right. This was a more extreme case of 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 definite of, of some conspiracy, and it's uh, still in the court system. So of course, it's not proven that that's what it is, but it, it appears that way. And you know, but at the reality is, is that look, thinking about like she had a grand goal, and don't we all in our businesses we have this big goal, this big hairy audacious goal, right? Right. And you look at that and you go, wow, this is really great. And you know, I would like to be a, I would like to be a part of that. I would like to have seeded that. I would like to be a part of that. But in the back of your mind, your job also, especially at a certain level of being on their board of advisors, which many of those big names were, you have to come in and say, are we asking the deeper questions and do they have a path to get there? And, yep. when, and it's not that, well, we're just this far away or we're just, it's just a little bit more money and it's around the corner. If you're not asking the questions of, do they build the right team? Do they have the bandwidth? Do, do they actually have enough investment? Because that's a problem yeah. too, right? Exactly. And so they if have enough not, investment already. Yeah. Then you're negligent as a board, as an advisor in that process, because yep. it is your, it is your job to be a part of that and, and to help make that happen. Because what I see happen a lot is that, um, I, this is what I asked before when we watch this movie, like, I don't know, my kids seem to like it all the time. The Martian with Matt Damon. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And so he says at the end, like, if you solve one problem that, and then you solve the next one that comes after that and you solve them in front of you and take each one as they come and figure out how to solve that, then eventually you get to go home. Right. And eventually you get to the innovation because, but if you skip all those and only have your eyes out here. Yep. Exactly. For the entire company, the entire investment group, the entire team, you will never make it from here there. Somebody has to solve those problems all along the way. And that's a good company. That's a company with a sustainable structure underneath it. It's also the same way with the money. The money has to flow in that same way too. And when I look at that, that's what I'm looking for is like, yep. are, they, are they taking input? Are they soliciting diverse opinions? And when I hear that block off, sound bitey kind of thing, I actually yep. am very turned off by it and I would have walked away. And so that's, that's for me what happens when we get a guest on who does that, like, I almost don't want to air it. And I know, so, I know. When I get the right. sound bites, I'm like, that didn't answer the question, actually. Can we dive a little further? Yeah. Or, like, I get it sometimes when I ask um, inconvenient questions at, of, of panels yes. when I'm in a, a, a room at, like I say, a blockchain conference. And I'm like, so what about uh, interoperability? Who's going to be like, how, what if your chain doesn't in operate with other chains? Or, or what are you doing about that? Because you've got this coin, you've got this ecosystem, but everyone knows they're going to have an exit. What if your exit is tied to this cryptocurrency? What are you? And when they're like, oh, uh, uh, and the pivot. And then like, it's, it's it like, oh, little ma'am, you don't really know. And I'll be like, oh, excuse me. I don't think that, let me just rephrase it. Perhaps you didn't understand. And when you have to rephrase it two or three times, you know that it's just like, you don't know yeah, the yeah. answer. Yeah. You, just, like, you basically are, you don't want to admit that you don't know the answer. You don't know how it's structured. You know, this is a really, a networking group of mine um, a year ago, bought into a coin that they were all in and excited about and I refused. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this was way before I knew enough yeah, right. of the industry to like have legitimately refused, but something didn't sit right with me in the way that they were answering questions. And really at the end of the day, these people are thinking they're going to get out of this in six months, nine months, something like that, or within a year. Right. And they're going they're to- They're not be playing able. a long game. Right. And, and so none of them were playing a long game and none of them could afford to lose the money. That was the other part that I saw, I saw there. And I thought, there's something really wrong here. And what was really wrong was that now that they, they made the money, like it grew, it did what it said it was going to do. So that was good. But there's no exchange because nobody wants in now. 
Oh, right. Everybody wants out and nobody wants in. So it's like you're stuck with the timeshare, right? Yep. <laughs> and so, exactly. And so that's what I saw was that kind of salesy model you're that they were stuck with the timeshare. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally it. It's totally it. And that's what I heard. And that was the tone of everything. And I was like, I'm, I'm out of there. Yeah. No. And so mm-hmm. I've had, so now that I've been like out there with videos and our, and our podcast and everything, I've got all these people coming up to me. Well, like, like, did I get scammed? And I was like, no, you bought in for what you signed up for. They, they raised the value. You did that. What you didn't anticipate and didn't understand and didn't ask the question was, was how am I going to sell it when I'm done with it so I can recoup that value? Right, right. How am I going to be able to have there, liquidity? Is there a marketplace for it? You didn't ask about the liquidity and now you're stuck. Right. And so I was like, you know, that's not, you know, that's on you. You right. didn't know enough to ask the questions. And it's also on them because they shouldn't have been selling to that group. That's how I really felt about it. That was not a group that didn't understand what they were getting into. Right. And so, you know, so, but that's how scams happen and they feel scammed, right? Yeah. Yeah. That makes but it sense. was also on them for not asking the right questions. So that's what we hope to bring here. That's kind of my point to all of this is that if we can bring, if we can bring perspective on how to build great companies and are these people on the path to that and asking those deep questions, is this investment structure strong? Do they have good financials? Like, yep. Uh, do they have a plan for interoperability or do they have a plan for liquidity? Like those kinds of questions are what you and I are, are bringing here. And that's, I think, at least asking those diverse questions and pushing back. So we're going to keep doing that for you guys. <laughs> yeah, and, totally. and, and hopefully, you know, at least then it starts you thinking about the questions you want to ask before you invest in something or before you get involved or before you give an opinion about some company. Because co- when you're in the blockchain market, when you're in the cryptocurrency area, people keep asking you questions. Should I do this? Right. And I'm like, mm, I don't want to answer that. But <laughs> did you ask these questions is a fair thing to respond. Yeah, right. Is it, right. It's a fair thing to respond. It's just you can't always be telling people what they should do. It's just, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? That's right. it. How, did you ask these questions? And so that's what we'll keep trying to do is bring great questions so that, that we can start to root out and, and see who's really succeeding here. Because in our and time goal, will tell. I mean, it's time will tell. Time. Yeah. People have been like, do you have any comps for your company? And I'm like, mm, tough. Comps? Yeah, Actually, a little comps, early. Like, uh, a little early just to be talking about how people have exited or been valued at this point. Come on. So, you know, early days are kind of exciting, but they're also a bit more mysterious. Yes. And so, yeah, realistic about what stages these companies are in. That's something that we really need to investigate further when, as, we're, as we're having the conversation with them. We'll, we'll be asking those questions. Um, and, you know, what I found is that there's some really, like, I just did an interview with Marcus Levin of, of XYO. It's going to mm-hmm. air. Um, and it may air right before this. Um, and, um, and, you know, they have a team of people who have done exit, who have exited, who have built stable companies outside of blockchain, outside of tokenization. And so I think that that's important to know, too, like ask the questions about the team. Um, because that may be an indicator, at least they understand the structure of a company. They didn't come into it 21 years old without right? any experience. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so with that, never having built a company and not surrounding it with pe- people who can build a company. So, you know, looking at that is always a really important thing to investigate here. So anyway, I hope we've answered your question, Bernard, and we hope other people will be encouraged to reach out to us and engage. Like, I think that's the ideal of what we want here. We want your diverse opinions. We want your diverse ideas and we want your diverse questions. Yep, absolutely. It'd be wonderful to get more of that. So definitely write in, comment, let us know what you think. Right. So I just want to throw, remember, newtrusteconomy.com is where you can always find all the information on us, on uh, on all of our posts that we have there. All We've the got social, videos. Everything. Everything's yeah. all there. We're really excited. We have New Trust Economy's channel on YouTube. That's relatively yep. new. So all of the videos can be watched straight in your YouTube app as well. Um, and of course, you can listen to us on, on your favorite podcast app. And it would be really great if you helped us out because we're pretty early on, if you not only subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app, but you also took time to rate and review us. We'd really appreciate that at this stage. Yes, that would be really helpful. Please rate and review. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. And um, we've really, I've been so pleased with the outpouring because uh, I manage a lot of podcasts and to be reached out to by people before you even hit your 50th episode is pretty impressive. So we have a community here who's active and engaged and I love that. And it makes me more excited to build great episodes for all of you. So thanks again for listening. This has been Tracy and Monica. 
Thank you guys so much. Have a great week and we'll catch you next time.